Hi, everyone. Welcome to Collection Spotlight with the Co Center for the Arts and First American Art Magazine. I'm Bess Murphy. I'm the curator at the Co Center here in Santa Fe. And I'm going to be here today with pieces from our collection that our guest artist, Karen N. Hoffman, has selected. Um, you will see me handling the pieces without gloves. Sometimes I give this little introduction commentary that generally speaking with most of the pieces in our collection, we use clean dry hands as opposed to gloved hands because we feel like we're better able to maneuver around with the pieces. It's more respectful for the pieces that we're custodians for. So I'm really excited to show some incredible beadwork today and I'll pass it off to Rachel to talk a little bit about the co. Hello everyone on this at least snowy day in Santa Fe. I, I love it. Um, I want to thank you all for coming uh, very much to uh, join us for this wonderful experience today with Karen and I want to thank Karen as well, as well as America um, for our partnership with First American Art Magazine. Uh, if you don't know about us, we have a website you can check out which is at coartscenter.org uh, and our mission is that we explore and connect through experiencing the world's indigenous arts using our uh, collection of around 2,300 pieces from all over the place. It's eclectic and uh, an amazing uh, experience to have. So I'm really looking forward to Karen walking us through some of a few of those pieces that um, she's going to talk about. So I'll hand it off to America. <laughs> I'm a little rusty. Yeah, so Good. I'm America Meredith um, of the Cherokee Nation, greeting you from Norman, Oklahoma, where it was negative six and I had no power this morning. So I edit a First American Art Magazine, which I think you might be able to see backwards, I don't know. But uh, mm -hmm. we're a quarterly print and digital magazine covering Indigenous Arts of the Americas, old and new. So I love this um, monthly uh, program that we have because um, it allows artists to get into the collections and give us their insights. And I like mixing up those categories and classifications of the, the new and the, um, the historical art. Um, and it's my profound honor to introduce Karen Ann Hoffman today. But first, I want to let you know this is a webinar, so you won't be able to unmute yourselves, but we do welcome questions. So you can type them into the chat or there's a Q&A function. So just type it in and um, we'll either get to it during the conversation or at the end, we'll open it up to questions that Karen can um, discuss. But Karen Ann Hoffman is a member of the Oneida <laughs> Nation. That's the one based in um, based in Wisconsin. She lives in Stevens Point. She studied Iroquois raised beadwork with Samuel Thomas and Lorna Hill, and now she teaches this technique to others. In 2020, the NEA named her a fellow. So that's one of the highest honors for customary arts in our nation. Her artwork is um, in collections throughout the country and time to get it in more. She, uh, she, uh, she exhibits nationally. So mm -hmm. I'm just really happy to introduce her. And she also got a master's degree in human development from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. So take it away. The first thing I want to say is welcome to everybody for being here. This is just marvelous to me that people all over I uh, want to spend a little bit of time with us together and I'm really excited that you guys gave up your time to spend it with us. The other thing I truly do want to do is say you uncle a big thank you to America Meredith of First American Arts Magazines, as well as to Bess the curator and to Rachel the executive director of the Ralph T. Coe Art Center for bringing us this monthly collector spotlight. I just think um, like-minded people who gather together to celebrate something so important is a really wonderful opportunity. And although I am not the world's most technological person in the world, I'm learning to kind of like Zoom for its ability to bring us together like this. So, so I thank you all, all of you, for your participation in making this happen for me, but more uh, for Haudenosaunee Arts. This is just wonderful. Um, so if I can, I do have a little something that I'd like to say. Um, I always like to remind people that Native art has been on this continent, has been on this earth for a very long, time, a very long time. From the very first, um, our people 
have used whatever was at hand in terms of material culture or art to express ourselves. And Haudenosaunee art is absolutely no different in that regard. Reaching back 10, 12, 14,000 years, depending on what archeologist you wanna to listen to, this art is born of the Eastern woodlands. Our forms, our designs, they are constantly reinterpreted over these last 14,000 years. They're constantly re-expressed with ever-changing materials, but they have for eons showed the world who we believe ourselves to be and to exclaim to the world those things that we value. Something that I think is really important to remember about Haudenosaunee art, but perhaps Native art in particular. I think it's important to remember that our art exists in at least three time frames all at once. This linear idea of a progression of time is not necessarily the way to consider Native art. We exist in connection to the past as a representation of the present and also as a remembrance of those faces we have yet to see. And so these three realms exist all at the same time when you're looking at Native art. And I think that that is very special. So I'm excited to see some of the pieces that Bess has brought for us, and then we can chat about them a little bit. Wonderful. All right. Do you have a preference for which um, one we start with? I know we're going to start earlier. Should we start with the earliest? Early yes, let's please do. Let's Perfect. try and go with that kind of a progression. OK. All right. So we'll start with this bag. And I'll just that here. fabulous bag. It is gorgeous. So one of the prejudices that I have when I get a chance to interact with these beautiful objects from our past is I try to look and only see what the object presents to me. I don't really know the intention of the maker of this or any other object. So I never want to make that presumption. But there are things that we can learn from these beautiful, beautiful pieces of art. And I think truly that spending time with this work best, like what you're offering us a chance to do, these are some of the greatest teachers available. So what we know about this piece just from looking at it is it's probably from what's called the um, early classical period of Haudenosaunee souvenir art probably comes from the 1800s through 1830 or 1840. It may well be Seneca in making. It is probably from the Eastern part of the Haudenosaunee territories. It is obviously gorgeous. It is embellished with linear designs. And these linear designs are what make us think that this piece is probably from the Western side of the Confederacy and from the earlier parts of this beaded form. These designs are very reminiscent of the kinds of linear design that you will find on woodland era Haudenosaunee pottery. And so when I look at these, I see this undeniable link of artistic expression, not only across time, but across forms of art. These beads are very small. If you were to measure them in contemporary terms, they're probably size 20s. They're very, very small seed beads. They're no doubt glass likely Czechoslovakian or Bohemian, and they're embellished on what looks to be silk ribbon. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous bag. And then the base of this bag, was this hide or cloth? It's hide. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. It okay to see the interior? So, yeah, absolutely. Got a little 
support inside of it. Oh, nice, nice. That helps the bag to live a little better of a life. So it's lined. Mm -hmm. yep. With a beautiful, vibrant color. Isn't that beautiful? Yep. And notice that the two sides of the bag are not the same in design. I always think that that's really something interesting. They're similar and they're related, but they are not um, mirror images of one another. Nice Just look. beautiful work, though. Just beautiful work. You'll see, America, you can see the... Yeah, the hide, exposed hide. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's flaps on both sides. It's not one flap uh, folding it over. Yeah, exactly. And it, they would have both originally been sti stitched on each side of the flap. This one still is somewhat closed. So closed. Yeah. Closed. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Probably not all the way down, but yeah. at least pinched at the corners of its mouth. Yeah. Yes. Right here on this edge. The, mm -hmm. the beadwork down to right here and that's and then it splits and then it splits exactly. and then it splits yeah yeah and that's really beautifully constructed really beautiful i mean whoever made it has such a mastery of uh geometry because those are, I, i've seen the stitch where it's um kind of diamond shaped but these are many many different uh forms almost like fish scales there's loops and then there's the hexagonal structures Right. And right. then there's the first the diamond. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All the things that it takes to run around a bag. One of the nicest pieces of technique, I think, in this bag are the dark blue lines that go midsection of that bag. To me, that's an expression of that geometry that you're talking about, Meredith. It's really crisply, really well executed. And when you think about the materials that might have been available in 1820, it probably wasn't a great LED light. It may not have been the world's sharpest steel needle. Certainly the thread is often single thread rather than the double threaded luxury that we have you know, to work with now. The conditions under which some of these older pieces were made, I think, adds to their beauty because of the complexity of their design. Yeah, just a lovely piece. Let's move best to something that might have been made maybe 10 or 15 years afterward. There is this progression in wow. um, Haudenosaunee arts that we're looking at that starts at least in these souvenir beaded bags with, like we said, the early classical period that's very, very linear. Now we're moving forward from 1800 or so, maybe to the mid 1820s or 30s. And you're starting to see more curvilinear designs showing up. The angles, the zigzag, as I call it, the zigzag is still there. The work is still flat or flush, but now it's not hide. That's maybe wool. Is it wool or is it velvet? I can't velvet. tell. It it's is velvet. velvet. <clears throat> In the 1820s and 30s, either was a commonly used material, either wool or velvet, but red. Red is such a luxurious color. And the colors in these bags are just dynamic, just dynamic. The use of the color wheel and the contrasts here are really um, indicative of an artist's eye. With the curvilinear, um, like these, um, these double spouts or these uh, fronds, would, mm -hmm. would, that be, um, would that be too, uh, needle applique? Are people using two different threads or are they using a single thread to tack it down? You know, it can be done with either style, okay. America, but when you look at some of the older bags, when the beads start to fall off, that's what uh -oh. really the tail. And so <laughs> when I look at the construction of this bag and I look at the straight line, it appears to me that there is one string of thread running through the center of all of those beads that okay. was coat or tacked down every second okay. beat, every third beat. And that's typically a two needle technique. So yeah, when I teach that. zigzag for contemporary design, I teach it as a two needle technique. 
I get a lot of pushback from people who are not used to working with two needles. But to me, that's the way to execute these designs, two needles, absolutely. Yeah, just gorgeous. And you're starting to see this heart shape pattern show up quite a bit once you get to the 1820s and 30s. And it will continue through Haudenosaunee arts in all kinds of shapes and styles. Um, I recently did a heart whimsy workshop. And in that workshop, we took a look at all the places that hearts show up in Haudenosaunee arts, everything from silver work to carved out mush paddles with the holes, the drain holes being in the shapes of hearts. Hearts show up all the time in our beadwork. It's really a design that reoccurs over and over and across styles. Just beautiful, just beautiful. And Karen, to interrupt you, will you yes. be doing um, these two needle applique workshops? Will you be doing workshops in the future? open to doing workshops. I'm really looking forward to the time when we're able to actually sit together and do workshops. I find that, you know, you can do them on Zoom, but I miss the sense of community. And I miss being able to look over people's shoulders and really give that fine instruction. Um, that is, I think, a hallmark of Native ways of learning. One of my mentors is a man whose name was Jim Frechette. And Jim Frechette was a Menominee carver of some high renown. And Jim used to tell me that the best way to transmit traditional knowledge is over time, in little bitty pieces, with repetition, and through story. And what he said is that Native pedagogy is really learning by hanging around. That it's that everyday life where these really important things get transmitted. Those little moments at the kitchen table, at the campfire, in the bedroom, in those really intimate moments, that's when culture is transmitted. And so these very informal, but very real pieces of contact are what I miss about a Zoom connection. So yeah, Meredith, I'm delighted to do workshops for folks and I'm really excited to get back to the eye to eye, knee to knee, heart to heart kind of workshops. My husband used to say, when you're talking with people, it's important to be able to hear their breath to know what's really going on. Cool, thank you. Mm. So Just look at the next one. Okay. Okay. The wall pocket next. Sure. So let me take us back a little bit. And I may have been remiss in assuming that everybody kind of knows what a Haudenosaunee is. And I've been talking about the Eastern Woodlands, but uh, the Haudenosaunee are people um, originally five and now six nations whose homeland is in the Eastern Woodlands. Kind of if you started where you think about Lake Erie and you moved east to the Hudson River and you went north and south of that imaginary line that they draw between what's now the United States and Canada, that might be thought of as the Haudenosaunee homeland. And in that homeland, um, our environment really um, is the cradle for our art forms. And it's important to me, I talked earlier about our art existing in three times at once. It not only exists in and across time, but it exists in and across geography. So if you think about the Western door the, where the, the Senecas, the keepers of the Western door were, that work in the early periods of the 1820s tends to be that angular, that zigzag, that flat that we've been looking at. 
But if you move forward in time from the 1820s and now we're looking at a piece that, you know, it might have come from 1880, 1890, something like that, another 70 years or two generations later. And it also comes from a little bit further east. Um, this has a more raised dimensionality to it than the flat work that we looked at earlier. We looked at the original piece from 1820 as being clearly angular. We saw that piece from 1830 and we saw the introduction of shapes and hearts and roundness. Now we move to maybe 1880, 1890 and not only do we get dimension, but we get these new floral shapes that start coming. So as we move a little bit west, this is quite likely Tuscarora or Mohawk, quite likely Tuscarora. Um, and we move later in time, you can see that the work changes. The work though, to anybody who spends time with these beautiful old pieces is clearly Haudenosaunee. To me, there are some fundamental cultural values that get expressed in any of these pieces. And one of them has to do with balance. It has to do with a foreground and a background, positive space, negative space, filled work against a background that shows off that filled work. And when you think about those elements of balance, you see it executed in Haudenosaunee artwork across geography and across time. So this piece specifically is very dimensional, not only in its beadwork, but yeah, thanks Beth for twisting it around. In its shape and its thickness, right? It's morphed, it's a wall pocket. And so these would have been for sale to the tourist trade, you know, the last part of the um, 19th century, likely sold around Niagara Falls, possibly Goat Island, um, there's a fabulous book written by um, Jerry Buren. It's called Cherished Curiosities. And in that book, he shares some um, photographs um, that he got from a Tuscarora beater, Grant Jonathan. And in those photographs, we see images of Tuscarora women selling items just like this at Goat and Luna Islands at the Niagara Falls. So this could well be that Tuscarora work. It's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. It's functional and it's designed to appeal to the market. By the late Victorian era, when Victorian women are dressing their homes, they're using, yes, thank you Bess for highlighting that basket with flowers coming out of it. Our beaters recognize the trends in home decoration and introduce those trends onto the beadwork that we sold to those folks. When I think about the really high level of business acumen that is demonstrated by this tourist trade market, I am extremely impressed with the distribution systems, with the marketing analysis, with all of that it takes to run a successful business. And this is a great example of that, that kind of forward thinking market knowledge. So thank you. And you said the back of this, the fabric was chintz? Oh yeah, I think it probably is America, thank you. And it'll be um, a very common background this particular color and this chintz. So chintz is just a kind of a cotton fabric. Um, often it will be a bit oiled so that it holds up pretty well. Um, but chintz, the reason people say, oh, that's just chintzy is because chintz was an inexpensive fabric compared to the velvet that's used on the foreground of this piece. So there again, there are some marketing decisions that are made here that have to do with profit and loss statements that are just, I think, so <laughs> subtle, but so impactful, so impactful, so smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Now this last piece, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering, yes, yes, is going to be the kind of work that I am particularly biased about and particularly drawn to. This work comes from the last quarter of the 19th century. So 1875, 1880, 1890, in that part of the Victorian era. This is high, high Iroquois or Haudenosaunee raised beadwork, right? The dimensionality of this is over the top. The opulence of this work is amazing. The abundance, the joy, the depth of character for this work is just exquisite. This is a whimsy. This was made for sale to the Victorian market. These would have been sold to Victorian women up and down the Eastern seaboard, but often at the Niagara Falls for those women to take home and put their big old Victorian hat pins in. These were dresser items, but they were made with the taste and the opulence of the time. The work is made from super simple materials, you guys, and I think that's really exciting. There's some Czechoslovakian glass beads. There are some metal sequins. There's a bit of cotton thread. There's a bit of velvet material and chintz on the back. Um, a steel needle and boom, you have everything you need to create this amazing opulent piece of artwork. These were considered small, whimsies, buy them on a whim, souvenir items, trinkets of the day, but they hold so much more than the original purchasers realized that they were getting they hold a great deal of history and a great deal of understanding about the Haudenosaunee way of looking at the world. Again, the dominant theme that I see here is balance. When you look at the way this is balanced, not symmetrical, not perfectly even, not weighted from one side to the other, but balanced. Balanced is a strong oh, statement. I'm so sorry. Beth, can you tell us about how much this weighs? I apologize. No, yeah. That's all right. Um, I'm so bad at that. It is definitely a couple of pounds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a lot of beads. Yeah. It's not like well, it's a lot of beads, but it's probably stuffed with sawdust. That's what I was gonna oh, say. Okay. I mean it's really dense. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the, how would the bone be used? Ask me that again. Oh, how would the bone be used? You mentioned bone maybe as a component. If I did, I did not mean to. There oh. are um, um, glass beads and metal sequins. Yeah. yeah. So I think not bone. Okay. Okay. And then yeah. these beads are much larger than the ones we used previously. You know, you're right. When we looked at that early uh, classical period work and we saw all those angles and we saw how flat the work was we looked at those beads as being size 20 or so these are in German they'd be a size 9 Czechoslovakia and they're a size 8 they're much larger a larger bead can do different things than a smaller bead can do a smaller bead is really good at changing directions and making a um, angles and sharp turns. Bigger beads are really good at piling and giving you that raised nature. So the switch to these larger beads is necessitated by the idea that you want this raised opulence on your pieces. I always say that um, I think that the job of an artist is to understand their materials, know what those materials are really, really good at, think of a message that you want to send with those materials, and then help the materials do the very best job that they can. You need to get your own ego out of the way and let the materials do what they're good at. And this 
is an exquisite example of a beater who knew exactly what those beads are good at. And then in your presentations, Karen, you've mentioned uh, the, um, oh gosh, uh, I'm That's thinking okay. the, word, the paper, the forms that they use to create the designs. And yeah. it's that's visible here. It is visible, so good eye for that. And to see the paper pattern underneath the form is not considered a flaw. In fact, it can be used as, as diagnostic to understand what old work is made from Haudenosaunee hands and what might be replicated by a non-native beater. Oh, interesting. Those patterns are considered to be diagnostic of native work. It's really important to be able to see them. It'll be hard for you to see on my example here, but this is a small beaded strawberry. And there is a paper pattern under here. And there is also um, the thing that created that pattern, which is my finger. I saw one time in a museum exhibit at the Castellani in Across Borders, and they were making mention that every time somebody made a paper pattern of a strawberry or a leaf, what you were really seeing was one woman's finger, one beater's finger that made that particular, particular shape. I always think that's just a lovely thing to think about. That intimacy of design creation and execution is stunning to me. I think there's a question from yeah. how often would horsehair and other items be used under the beads to give the raised effect? So some people, um, there are some anthropologists that I've read um, who say that uh, the Iroquois women's work uh, is lumpy because they put too many beads on a string. There's other work that I've read that says that the work is raised because it's stuffed underneath with horsehair I've not heard, but cotton is, is a common. And while that may well be a French technique, it is not an Iroquois technique. And so what you do to make raised beadwork is you lay a line of beads in one direction and you overcast that line of beads with multiple in an opposite direction. And that's what gives you the dimension. There is no cotton underneath of this. There is only beads and technique. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, but again, you know, when you see that something is stuffed with cotton underneath, that's a diagnostic that it's, it's more likely a French or a, a French learning than it is a native hand. Beautiful technique though, isn't it? Really well executed. But as I say, this work has gone on for a very long time. Sometimes people will ask me if I know what people use prior to beads. And I don't know specifically what people use prior to beads, but I do know that you'll find work predating beads that's also dimensional and is moose hair tufting. And so I think that there is a relationship in our dimensional design that goes from beads of the current day and was influenced by moose hair tufting of a previous day. I think that's why our work has that dimensional quality to it. And this would be a broader question since whimsies mm -hmm. are very much for the public and they're all okay to see. Are there Haudenosaunee designs that people should be careful about that aren't really meant to be seen by the public and shouldn't be exhibited in galleries? You know, I talk about that in, in a certain way. I think that there are, um, I talk about three strains of Haudenosaunee beadwork, particularly raised beadwork. And I think that there are whimsies and those absolutely were made for sale America. And those absolutely are trade items. And you know, I, I see no problem in, in showing them. I think the other strain are um, very personal items, um, regalia, um, ceremonial things, death things, 
things that uh, really do not get bought and sold, um, at least not outside the community. They may be handed down generation to generation. They be, may be made for one another at death or marriage or naming, but they are not for sale. The third stream is a stream of art that I'm involved in, and that's a contemporary expression of long existing forms and patterns, but pushed, expressed, stretched, grown into a new way. And that contemporary stream is the one that I am the most interested in. That's where I do my practice. And so guess- other things that shouldn't be in galleries, you know, I think there are. I think there are. Um, but I also think there are things that should be in galleries and museums because the work that I do, and I'm talking about myself now, I think of my legacy pieces as being imbued with a life and a force and an animacy that wants to interact. You know, I was raised by a mother and father and my father was a musician. And it occurred to me that playing music for yourself is fine, but music is only really alive when it also has an audience. Art begs for interaction, in my view. And so I want um, museums to step up to their responsibilities in caring for the work that we artists do and have done and will do and exhibit them in a proper way in conversation with the artists that created them whenever that's possible, but with a sensitivity about what those pieces want when the artist is not there to speak. There are some museums that are really doing a fabulous job with that. And one of them is the Field Museum with whom I have been involved for the last couple of years. They are doing some cutting edge work about letting art lead the decision-making process when it comes to constructing exhibits. It's really amazing work, really groundbreaking work. So that's a good reason to focus on whimsies because we know what they're, they're totally <laughs> And I just I just mentioned in the Q and A that um, there was the Grand Council of the Haudenosaunee in 1975. They issued their edict that said that um, false face society masks, pornhouse mm-hmm. society masks, these aren't art. Those aren't art. They're living beings. So they're totally different. <laughs> That's true. I think that is true. And I do see those things come to market, and I feel badly for them. I feel badly for them um, because it is inappropriate like a member's bowl, it is inappropriate. America, there's a few more questions. Are you yeah, that's a bunch. Should we kind of keep these to the end so we can yeah. ask you? Yeah, Could should we do whatever we want, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, what do you want to do, Karen? <laughs> well, I want to do, um, actually, I would like to take a look at Bernard if we could. Um, um, so is that the- yep. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna go, we will get to the questions, don't worry, but. (laughs) Yeah, this will take me a most second. That's okay, oh, thank you so much. I could talk about any of these pieces, but what we're sharing right now, what America is bringing forward are some pieces of the work that I was just talking about, that third stream of art, that while being deeply, deeply culturally connected is expressed with modern materials and um, meant to have an animacy and a life and an interaction with people. So this is a piece that I made recently. It's Bernard, Bernard the Buzzard Bag. Uh, Bernard now lives at the New York State Museum. And I'm very happy about that because had Bernard stayed in my closet in my secure storage facilities, he would never have had the chance to talk to the thousands of people that he'll get a chance to interact with at the New York State Museum. And that's another museum that takes its responsibilities for these kinds of pieces very seriously. So if I can get you to click to the next um, picture, uh, we'll take you through a brief, yeah, that's fine, that's time. So um, 
my home is in a rural area outside of Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And one June afternoon, my husband, Mike, and I, we were driving into town for groceries and we saw this buzzard in the ditch and <clears throat> I figured, but it would be dead when we came home from groceries. But when we came back from groceries, we could see that that bird was still alive on the side of the road. And so we pulled over and I told the husband, you know, what I really said was put that poor bird out of its misery, stomp on his head because I don't think he's going to make it. And when Mike got out of the car to reluctantly do that, he said that the buzzard turned and looked up at him with one eye and flapped a wing kind of weakly and Mike just couldn't. So what we did was gather Bernard up in the back of our car and drive him to a raptor recovery center and they did the best that they could with him in Antigo, Wisconsin, but Bernard the Buzzard, he didn't make it through the weekend. So next one, please. So a few seasons later, um, my Mike and I were walking around our property. We live on 40 acres and I looked up into a beautiful September sky and in that sky, I saw the sun and I saw the moon and in between that sun and the moon, my God, there was Bernard just flying. And I said to myself at that moment, you know, that's Bernard, that's our buzzard. He's come back. He wants something from me. And when I looked up in that sky, I thought what he wants is for me to tell his story. And so I went home that afternoon and I began work on Bernard the buzzard bag. So let's take, a, take the next one. So you're right, you know, there are paper patterns underneath of all these major kinds of beadwork. And in this particular idea, what I had to do was make Bernard. Nobody had beaded a buzzard before. So it was up to me to really learn what a buzzard looks like. What's their function? What do they do? What's their place? What makes a buzzard a buzzard and not any other bird and develop a pattern based on that. Next one, please, Nanka. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about Bernard, but I also spent a lot of time thinking about that sun that was up in the sky and what makes the sun a sun. And the sun, he's as the old people say, our elder brother, the sun. And what makes him so special every day, every day that elder brother, the sun comes to us. And he's responsible not only for the light in the sky, but all those fires on the earth and all those fires that cook our food and warm our water and keep our elders from freezing and make our babies comfortable. All of those fires, all the importance of those fires. So I had to think about how can I translate those responsibilities into beads and make a pattern for that. Next one, please, Meredith, America. So I figured out how to make the bag click please. I worked on those patterns and I began the work of the bag. It takes me a year or more to make any of these legacy pieces. I am probably the world's slowest beater, but I like to think I'm a thoughtful beater as well. Next one, please. So you begin with that outline and then I move on to Bernard. Now in the story of Bernard and the son, our elder brother, the two intersect. And so it was important to me that the color of the beads be made to show that intersection. And so he's made from 14 karat gold beads that were a gift from my teacher, Samuel Thomas. Next one, please. Wow. Begin filling Bernard in. Now I know that buzzards appear black when you look at them in the sky, but as I got to think about buzzards and I got to know them better, I realized every one of their feathers is just a little bit different and they're not black, black, they're black with reflections of this and that. So in the making of Bernard, in addition to the 14 karat gold beads, I used six different kinds of black beads to show the depth and resilience of the different kinds of feathers that make buzzards clothing. Next one, please. And so similarly with the elder brother, the son, you know, native people are not often very deeply in love with gold. We have issues around gold and Christopher Columbus and hawk spells and so on. But as I said, these beads were a gift from my teacher, Samuel Thomas, he and his mom, had done a really important series of work uh, around something called power of place and strength of being. And so they visited power places all around the world, Machu Picchu and Easter Island. And one of the places they visited were the pyramids. And 
And the Egyptians of those days, they did love gold. So the beadwork that Samuel and his mom did after visiting the pyramids had to have gold beads in it. And when Sam came back, he handed me, you know, a handful of those gold beads. And he said, well, maybe, you know, maybe you'll do something nice someday, Karen Ann. You know, let me give you these. Maybe you'll step up. I think with Bernard, I might have done something nice, but this is the son and our elder brother. Next one, please. And so in the story, deer hooves will play a part. And so these are the toes of deer that, you know, have come my way. Next one, please. And the bag gets sewn together. Next one, please. And the deer toes are used and there are rattle in there. And that rattle of deer toes, my old people told me that the rattling of deer toes is the sound that was made when the world was first created. So those are important, important rattles in there. Next one, please. All of this is hand sewn, which is why it takes me forever to make a piece. I do no machine stitching on any of the work that I do. Next one, please. And so the ribbon work is also done by hand. Next one, please. And so this is the story of Bernard, as anyway, as I know this story. It's a long time ago, you guys, the birds, they didn't have any clothes. And I don't know why that's just really the way it was. And during that time, the birds, they would fly around and they would look and they would say, oh, you know, look at Gunji, look at the fish, look at those clothes that they have. Oh, see how they shimmer and shine. And the birds would say, I wish we had clothes, you know, but they, but they didn't. And the birds would fly and they'd look over the deer and they'd say, oh, you know, look at the beautiful clothing that deer have. And look at those horns and look at that coat and I wish we had clothes but you know the birds they just didn't I don't know why but they didn't and the birds they'd fly over the ungwe ungwe you know the people and they'd say even look at the human beings look at the clothing that the human beings have and the birds they would wish for clothing but they didn't have any and so one day the birds after a long time they decided that maybe Maybe they would send one of their number up through the hole in the sky and they would ask for the favor of clothing. And so they thought about it, you know, who should go? And at first they thought, well, Eagle should go because he's, you know, some say the leader of the birds and he's big and he's strong and he should go. And the Eagle said, you know, no, 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 I, I can't, you know, I... If I am to be your leader, then I have responsibilities here and I cannot abandon those responsibilities. So someone else will have to go. And, you know, they say that um, Blue Jay stepped up and Blue Jay said, you know, I'll go, I'll go. I can do it. I can do it. But, you know, the birds, they said, you know, thank, thank you, Blue Jay. That's very nice of you to offer. And you have, you know, many, many good qualities, but you might be a little brash for this and we don't want to offend and so thank you but perhaps someone else will have the right skills and a hummingbird came up and zzz, he'll do it he'll do it and the bird said you know thank you hummingbird that's very kind of you and you have many good qualities but you know we think you might be a little too you know little to make it all that way up into the hole in the sky and so you know we're not sure that you've got quite the right skills for the job and one by one all the birds offered and one by one it was decided that you know they didn't have quite the right skill set until somebody said buzzard buzzard can do it he's big he's strong he's got a good heart he'll be able to carry our request up through the hole in the sky and so Although this story can take days to tell, I'm going to condense it down. And Buzzard, he did that. He started flying up and he left the next morning. He left so early, they say he didn't even take time for breakfast. And he started flying and he flew and he flew and he flew. But pretty soon, because he didn't eat, he started getting a little weak. And he thought, oh, no, if I take time to do some hunting, I'm not going to be able to fulfill my responsibilities and deer down below deer he saw a buzzard's plight and so what deer did was he looked up and he called me and said brother let me help you what I'll do I'll lay down my body and you won't have to take the time to hunt you just come you just eat you just feast on my body and you know that's how it still goes today because buzzard 
he doesn't have to hunt. He cleans carrion and he keeps our rivers and our woods clean for us. And he keeps disease down by eating off those dead bodies. And so we're grateful for that. And so Buzzard ate and he was refreshed and he began flying more and more and he went up and he passed his elder brother, the sun. He was so close, you know, they say that he burned his head. Finally, he made it through the hole in the sky and finally he had a chance to ask and finally he was given permission. And what happened was Buzzard came back down to Council Rock with a bag, a bag full of magic clothes. And one by one, each of the birds could reach in there and pull out a suit. And by magic, that, that suit would fit them. But they only got one try. They only got one reach. Well, first, you know, Eagle reached in and boy, he got a beautiful brown suit with yellow boots and a great white cap. And he looked just stunning. And, you know, Hummingbird reached in there and he got a a beautiful green jacket and a ruby red shirt and oh it just flew off looking just beautiful and on and on it went until finally all the birds had had their pick except for buzzard and buzzard he reached down into that bag and i don't know what happened because i wasn't really there and i don't know if the magic just ran out or what the problem was but when buzzard pulled out his suit it didn't fit him you know, his legs popped out the bottom and his burned head stuck through the top and the wings were just beaten and wrangled and he just looked a mess. And you might think, the old people had told me, you might think that the other birds would have laughed at him and made fun of his ill-fitting suit, but you know, they don't. They respect Buzzard. He kept his word. He did what he promised his community he would do. He sacrificed his time, his effort, everything. And he went and he kept his promise to the community. And you know, if you look now when Buzzard flies over, even still to this day, all the birds, they get real quiet. They sit real low and they'll let Buzzard pass over and they show him that respect because he kept his promise and his commitment to his community. So. It's kind of a short version of how the birds got their feathers as I know it. And that's the kind of thing that I think that our artwork can do. It's beautiful to the eye. It's lovely in terms of design. It honors those traditions about raised beadwork and balance, but it connects us deeply to the cultural values that we are to hold and send forward and respect from the past. And that's what I try to do with my legacy pieces like Bernard. So I beg your indulgence for that story and I thank you for taking the time. And if there are any questions, I'm looking at the clock, we've got about 10 minutes. I'm yeah. happy to answer them. We're flexible too. This We're will be flexible. Go. It will be recorded. Rachel's um, going to edit and she'll be able to publish it on the co website. Okay. Do, you wanna, do you wanna look at the rest of the images? You know, we can flip through them real quickly, okay. but I do wanna get to the last two. So that's yeah. great. Thank sure. you. And then I'll just make a Go. I'm so sorry. One of the questions okay. was, are there sinew on any of the bags on, on um, Haudenosaunee beadwork? Um, if you mean where some of the very old pieces held together with sinew, um, pre-whimsy, I yeah. don't know because I've not taken one apart, but okay. it would make sense to me that they would have been. That might be a best question too, like with the um, quill work embroidery or Haudenosaunee, um, do, do you find um, sinew on the quill work? That would be a best question because I am not a quill worker. <laughs> well, I am definitely not a quill worker. We have um, a few older pieces in the collection. We have some mocks that are a little bit older than this, mm -hmm. um, but not very many, to be honest. And so I would say that I, I don't know that I would give a 100% affirmative answer, but I think it, I agree it's likely. Sorry. We should totally go through that uh, collection and take a peek. That's a great yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to speak to these? Uh, sure. Um, you know, there are many things I am not. I am not a quill worker. I am not uh, proficient in using Zoom. And I am not a potter. But I am influenced, as we talked about, by some of the designs on the late woodland pottery. 
So I do work in velvet, and this was an attempt to express the values of that late woodland style pottery through the medium that I, in which I work. Um, I told you before that I think as a beater, you need to make a choice about what you're going to try to express and then let the beads do the work, get the heck out of the way and let the beads do the work. So in this case, Haudenosaunee pottery is kind of known for its beautiful buff color. And so I didn't choose the color of the velvet. The pot chose the color of the velvet. We talked about um, the linear decorations on those early pots, and that's why you see this brown border on here to replicate that stippling that was done on some of those earlier pots. You see the classic crown or neck or castellani that's indicative of Haudenosaunee pottery of the period, and so I put that on this particular piece. And as time went on across Haudenosaunee pottery, there were first on the Castellanis, just little poke marks that might've been eyes. Then there were scrapes that suggested faces. And as time went on, real mounded effigies began to be molded into the clay on those Castellani points. And so I'm not working in clay, but I can use beads to replicate those effigies. The reason that there's that shot of the red in this piece is because what I was thinking about in addition to the pot is the instructions from the peacemaker who told us to think about our environment as one pot with many spoons. One pot, all are welcome to feast at the bounty of our environment. Many spoons are welcome, but as you take, you have a responsibility to replenish. And when we think about that teaching, it's often couched in the notion of beaver tail soup. And so that red in there is meant to replicate that delicious beaver tail meat and represent that beaver tail soup. So one pot, many spoons, good lessons, good lessons. Should we go on? Yeah, sure, flip through. So I live in Wisconsin. I talked about effigies on the sides of that Castellani. Another thing that people are more familiar about effigies are probably effigy mounds. And effigy mounds are piles of dirt that are deliberately shaped. In our area, Wisconsin, the Midwest, um, they're thought to be 800, 1,000, 1,200 years old, you know, something like that. 1,100, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's pretty typical. They seem to fall into certain categories. There are conical mounds, which are, you know, roughly rounded shapes. There are effigy mounds, which means they are living shapes, and some think they look like panthers or snakes or birds. And there are very few, and this is the only known anthropomorphic human shaped mound in the state of Wisconsin, right? Yeah. Maybe and so, flatten some of them. Right, right, right. So, this is man mound. He was originally made again, maybe a thousand years ago outside of Baraboo, Wisconsin. In his original construction, he was 216 feet long and probably three or so feet high piled baskets and baskets full of dirt had to have been transported from at least a mile away because the soil from which he has made is not the soil on site. In the late 1800s in Wisconsin, a decision was made to run a county road through the legs of the man mound in Baraboo, Wisconsin. From the knees down, his legs were destroyed. When I went to visit the man mound, I felt like I developed a personal relationship with him. And when I saw how he was built by the original artists with pound or miles or pound or mounds and mounds of dirt, I thought I could use mounds and mounds of beads. And when I put him on that footstool, I gave him back his legs. And I deliberately chose to put him on a footstool, irony intended, to give him back what had been taken from him. 
a friend of mine is volunteer caretaker at that mound. And when Rob Nury started tending mound man again in real life, the first things to come back growing on mound man were strawberries. And so when I rebeated mound man on that footstool, I gave him those strawberries, that medicine to keep him whole. Yeah, yeah, so mound man. Again, I was invited by a regional archeologist to accompany him while he was mapping an undocumented rock art site in Southwestern Wisconsin. So there was a small crew of us. We knew that there was one piece of rock art up the bluff. And one morning we all met and, you know, I tease and say he blindfolded us so that we didn't know where we were going. But the truth is, you know, we don't talk about where this rock art is because um, most rock art in Wisconsin is on private property and most rock art in Wisconsin, estimates say 90%, are vandalized and damaged. So when we find it or see it, it's not something that we necessarily give out a location for, but this was an undocumented site and it was April and it was rainy and it was icy and it was cold and we had to walk way, way up the bluff and we knew as we were slipping and sliding to get on up that icy path that underneath this one small rock outcropping, we knew there was a piece there. So the archeologist goes in and his helper goes in and the woman who invited me, she went in, she's a rock art artist, Jerry Schraub. Her husband went in, my husband went in. It's a small little space I couldn't even fit in. So I'm like, well, that's all right. I'll just wait, I'll go around the corner of this outcropping. And when I went around the corner, I saw him. I saw that breath line. I saw that arrow scratched into a rock. And I say, hey, you know, Ernie to the archeologist, is this rock garden? And he's like, yeah, but we had no idea it was there. It just moved me to be standing, sitting, squatting truly in the same spot that a native artist, I don't know how many years ago stood or squatted when they etched this beautiful caribou into the rock. I wanted to be that caribou in honor and respect for that ancient artist and what they had left for us. The staying power of native art is so strong. It's so powerful that to be able to just taste a little bit of it like that was a great honor for me. And so rock art caribou to commemorate that, that artist of long ago. Yeah, go ahead, page two. Yeah, there's a close up. This is Woody. He lives at the Derman Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City. Um, he's really a doctor. There's a lot going on in this piece, but um, one of the messages that I wanted to give is the, um, there's a misconception that woodpeckers harm the trees. And when you look at this piece very closely, you can see by Woody's beak, there's one amber bead and that bead stands for a birch borer. And what's happening here is Woody is not hurting this tree, he's doctoring this tree. If he can surgically remove that birch borer, it's better for the health of the tree. The better the birch trees do, the better our native communities do. The better our native communities do, the better our environment does. Woody is responsible for doctoring our entire environment. I love that about the responsibilities of our brothers and sisters and how we're called to help. Go ahead, flip through. So this is a bear. Um, go ahead and flip through. Oh. It's part of, right, it's part of a bigger story. This piece will be living at the Field Museum in Chicago as part of the new Native Hall exhibit. This tells the story of the great bear hunt. And I won't go through it now, but that bear hunt is written in the sky. It's written in what people think of as the dipper. 
but we know to be a great white bear, four hunter brothers, and their little dog. So go ahead, next one. I was doing a series of those large mats. Uh, the great bear hunt is probably 39 or 40 inches in diameter plus the fringes. I think that this one is about 36 inches in diameter. Your average whimsy is six or eight inches. And so I like to blow that up by a factor of 10 or so. Um, it seems to me too often that people, when they look at our whimsies, they do diminish them. They do just kind of give them an offhand. I like to make our work so big that they can't walk past it. It demands attention. And so I work in a much larger scale. This one tells a story of the responsibilities of the trees and something that creation asked the trees to do in looking over Turtle Island. And so it carries that tradition in it. Go ahead for the next one, please. Okay. Close up. Close up of the turtle. Just to show you the techniques of raised beadwork. To develop this particular um, pattern, I spent, I mean, I have known turtles over my life, um, but I also went to a local museum and I went to their. Um, collections and they were kind enough to let me take home the shell of a Western painted turtle for long-term measurement and study. It's important to me that the beadwork that I do is as biologically accurate as is possible in representing the animals that I'm trying to represent. So the number of plates on this shell, I think we all know there are 13 major plates surrounded by 28 minor plates, and that's of course a calendar, but this is exactly the shell of the turtle that I studied, exactly 13 major plates and exactly 28 circling minor plates. I found that to be very compelling. So, next oh. one. This is a walleye treaty footstool. It also lives at um, the New York State Museum. They acquired him, they adopted him maybe 10 years ago. In the state of Wisconsin, when I was a young bride um, back in the 80s, um, our Chippewa neighbors were asserting their rights to hunt and gather on ceded territory is guaranteed to them through treaties. That behavior was not welcomed by a large majority of the non-native population in Wisconsin. And so in Northern Wisconsin, where a lot of that um, spearing for walleye was going on, you heard cries of, um, you know, spear an Indian, save a walleye. Spear a pregnant squaw, save two walleyes. It was awful. It was awful. I lived 200 miles from that particular part of ceded territory, and I'm not Chippewa. My husband wasn't Chippewa, but that didn't stop the local sportsmen, shall we say, from putting dead cats in the mailbox and shooting out the truck. You know, it made me think really of um, what the Thanksgiving address tells us. And it tells us to be mindful and thankful for those waters that refresh us and that bring us a slaking of our thirst. And to be mindful and thankful for those fishes who not only clean those waters, but give up their bodies so that we and our families may live. And it made me wonder about people to whom this is such a foreign concept that they cannot see the beauty in interacting with the waters and fishes in the way that creation has intended. And so I made Treaty Rights Footstool to help me think through that process. And again, I'm very pleased that he lives at the New York State Museum, where he has a chance to interact with the general public and help them to think about natural ways 
of interacting with our brothers and sisters, the fishes and the waters, and our responsibilities to both. I think beadwork is an extremely powerful medium. I truly do. I think that Native life is extremely powerful and it has been for a long time. I'm currently involved in a project that is very emotional for me and has been very emotionally taxing. I live in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, and the university from which I graduated, the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point, was built on a mass native burial. In the 1860s, Wisconsin was a turbulent place, let's say. Settlement was occurring at an extremely rapid place, pace. And with the influx of settlers, uh, the traditional populations found themselves ousted from their homelands. And so in the 1850s and 60s, there were just mass migrations of displaced natives who could no longer hunt and fish in the ways that are natural to us. And so by 1860 in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, Posse Bikinen, which is the Menominee name for the place, the original name for the place, the Menominee and other Indians were no longer welcome as the settler population began to grow close to the riverbank. And so a group of displaced natives found themselves encamped on a parcel of land east of Posse Bikinen. Scarlet fever broke out in the white population up by the river and somehow got transferred into the refugee camp. And although we're not sure, the records say that 30 or 60 or 70 natives died in that refugee camp. And we know that they buried their, they buried their families right there on the edge of that encampment. But because the population of Stevens Point was growing, the natives couldn't stay there long. And in a very few years, they were forced north, leaving their dead behind, leaving their buried behind. Now on the site of that burial ground as Stevens Point began to grow, you know, they put in a quarry. And in addition to putting in that quarry, they, they built a garbage dump for the city of Stevens Point. So where the university now sits, you have the bodies of natives covered by historic garbage. And on top of that was built the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. It started out as a normal school back in 1894. And it seems funny to some people that, you know, why did that land get chosen for the normal school? There were other areas, but Yes, yeah, Stevens Point began to grow post-1860 into the 1870s and the 1880s. That land around that old native refugee camp began to sell. But what never sold, what never sold was that chunk of land on which they were encamped, on which they were buried. And we know from newspaper articles published in the 1930s interviewing survivors of the 1860s pandemic we know that the reason people didn't buy that land was because as the survivors said, of course not. Everybody knew there were bodies buried there. No one would buy that land. And so through a series of land transfers, it comes to be the base for the Stevens Point Normal School, which turns into the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. These dead, called to me, and I don't mean that in an odd kind of a way, but I mean it in the way that any of our dead ask for respect and ask for rest. And so I've been working with an archeologist, Dr. Ray Reeser, who was able to get the state of Wisconsin a couple of years ago to formally declare this area a native burial. He and I have been working to get the university to put a permanent monument marker on site. It is my determination that there be a native designed and native vetted monument marker 
I don't know what it'll look like. That's for the Native artists to determine. I want that call for art to go out to our Native sculptors. I want a group of Wisconsin's Native students, scholars, professional artists to look over those proposals and to help choose that final monument for our dead. I want Wisconsin's Native poets, students, writers to write the text that will accompany this monument so that our ancestors' Native voices will finally have the opportunity to teach and to educate the public about the right ways to treat one another. The university has been slow in responding to my determination. At one point they said they were busy because there's a pandemic. And I thought it was just ironic that the very thing that killed these people was being used as an excuse to continue to ignore them. But the tide is changing. People are rallying. The state of Wisconsin just issued its budget and our governor has included in that budget an amount of money that will go directly to the funding of this monument marker. And that will pay a native artist or artists or group of artists, I don't know what that will be, I'm not a sculptor, to create this monument in a native voice for our people. So this is what I have spent my last couple of years deeply involved in. I'm extremely emotional about it. I'm very excited that we seem to be moving forward and I am looking forward to the moment when those dead finally, finally get that acknowledgement, respect and rest that they've been waiting for, for 150 years. So thank you for the time to speak for those who can no longer speak for themselves. Do you wanna take a couple more questions that people have- uh, Sure, sure. Holly Zane asked if the names of the oh, people hi, Holly. <laughs> if the names of the people are known. No, the names of the people are not known to us. There is a good chance that with more research, we could certainly come up with some more information, but at this point, they are unknown to us. I don't know why that did that. <laughs> And then um, backtracking quite a bit, what are the yeah. materials that create the structure for the whimsies? So there's not a whole lot that it takes to make a beautiful whimsy. You need a piece of fabric. You need some cotton thread. Mm -hmm. You need some beautiful glass beads. And you need, I don't even know if this can be seen. There we go. That's a needle. I'm trying to put it in front of my black shirt. That's a needle. So yeah. So pretty simple materials, a bit of a steel needle, some cotton thread, some beautiful glass beads, a little piece of fabric. You have everything you need to recreate a culture. Isn't that cool? Does someone have they have cardboard or leather? I'm sorry, Bess. I was gonna say, like the structure on the wall pocket that we have here is it's cardboard, probably cardboard like material or paper. Oh yes, yes. Okay, yeah, sure. So if you're making a dimensional piece, it needs to have a skeleton. Yeah. Yes. And so um, sometimes that skeleton is cardboard, sometimes it's tag board, um, older pieces. I think the oldest thing I've ever seen, um, I was shown that it had a newspaper from like 1700s in it. Oh my gosh. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think in a lot of ways, people use what's at hand. Do they use what's at hand? 
Mm -hmm. Upcycling. And then Upcycling. We, we had the question about your man mound, the stool. What collection yeah. is that in? What? What collection is that in? He still lives with me. He is destined for a home with the caretaker of the man mound. Okay. Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay. And someone thanks you for the presentation and oh. just that it reminds her of her grandmother's beating circle when they would tell stories and teach language in Onondaga. I think that's wonderful. So Thank there's you several for that. that you can read. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, there's a lot. You have a lot of responses. I mean, oh, someone wants like land acknowledgments, which I'm coming from the Wichita and Affiliated Tribes land. We're all in different places. <laughs> um, I'm going to say I have it. issues around land acknowledgments um, because not that they're not that they're not a step forward. I think that they are, but I think that they're structurally imperfect. Mm -hmm because over the course of 14,000 years on any given piece of soil, many people have been sustained. And I think sometimes that land acknowledgements make us choose a moment in history. And they make us think that those people that were there that second are somehow rightful and that may or may not be true. I would like to see, and I don't know how this is going to happen, some kind of a development of an acknowledgement that there is land responsibility, that whoever is there is responsible to be the caretaker, and that we are grateful for all the caretakers who come before us. We recognize our place in this chain of responsibility, and we commit to be caretakers for all those who come after us. And then an artist asked a question, just yeah. ask artists advice for emerging artists. How, how do you end up selling your works to museums? Do you approach the museums? I was having a conversation about this the other day and you know, you just gotta have a, you just, you just gotta go there. You know, P pick up the phone, you don't know me, but. That works. <laughs> you know what? No. Time after time, time after time, it does not work. Time after time, it does not work. But sooner or later, America's going to pick up the phone and say, you know, I've heard you've been bothering people that I know. <laughs> but it, it's just persistence. It's showing up. The world is run by those who show up. Go to the museums. Make friends asked to visit the collections. Curators are so open to having people come and study the collections. Once you make friends with museums, who knows? Who knows what will happen for your work? But just show up. And then um, do you want to speak at all um, what's happening um, March 4th uh, with the NEA, what they're going to be able to do? Oh, yeah, sure, for sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I am very pleased to represent for Native Art as a 2020 National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellow. Um, there are nine of us, I think, this year, and um, two of us at least are Native. The other is from Wisconsin, Wayne Vallier, a wonderful uh, birch bark artist, makes uh, lovely, wonderful canoes. Typically, the NEA would bring us all into Washington. There would be concerts. We would have a chance to demonstrate our work. We would gather and celebrate, but COVID. So this year, the NEA did something kind of cool. They sent film crews to all of our homes. And what's gonna happen on March 4 is there will be a video shown that will let you be in the living rooms of each and every Heritage Fellow from the 2020 class. So in a way, more people get to come to our party than would have had we just been in DC. 
So I do invite everyone to come and celebrate with all of us. There's so much talent in this great land of ours, so much amazing talent. People will be very pleased to spend an hour with us. And I wanna give a little teeny plug. Um, the last two days of this month, the weekend, we'll be doing a We Have Words for Art, which will be a online symposium that's free and open to the public, uh, sponsored by First American Art Magazine. And we'll discuss the issues about writing about um, art by indigenous peoples of the Americas. And people can access that through our website, which is First American, we have the longest website in the world, <laughs> First American <laughs> com backslash words so we have words for it and um thank you all so much this was our I'll best just take one last thing i just see sure. my mom waving at me so i would like everybody to wave to my mom betty messner there <laughs> oh she's proud of you <laughs> this was our most attended one it was really wonderful thank yeah. you uh, and thanks to everyone who stayed Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Ann. And I can't oh. wait to get you out here so that we can dig into the collections in person and hopefully figure out some fun projects. I talked to Sam. We're up for it. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds fantastic. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Thanks to everyone. Um, I am deeply grateful. Yeah. To be <laughs> continued. <laughs> Stay safe and warm out there. Okay. Bye. Okay, closing it down. Y'all take care.